Hello everyone, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good, good night to some of you. Well, thank you very much for coming to our keynote today with Julie Lindsay. Julie has already presented once for us this weekend, which is a fantastic thing for the conference. Today, Julie is going to be sharing um, a session titled Connect and Collaborate for Global Understanding a Pedagogical Shift. Uh, Julie is an educator and, and trainer who travels the world sharing her knowledge on how to connect and collaborate, um, not just teachers but students. And she is a fantastic speaker and every time I listen to her I, I learn something new. So I'm looking forward to today. Julie and I are lucky enough to live in the same part of the world, um, about 10 or 15 minutes away from each other, uh, which is unusual. Um, because it's a very, very beautiful place in Australia on the north coast here, so on the north coast of New South Wales, I should say. I'd like to thank our sponsors and our supporters for helping us bring you the conference this weekend. So a very big thank you to Steve Hargaden and the Learning Revolution Group. Um, their project has been, has been a fantastic supporter for us. and the volunteers from the Australia E-Series, we have been working really hard to get this together for you. Uh, we have an extra special thank you to Cyber Academy for sponsoring us, allowing us to do, um, to, to do some advertising and so on. And a big special thank you to Shambles and Coach Carol for their undying support of the conference. So while we're getting started this morning, if you'd like to use your mouse to grab the little arrow and then grab one of the tools and put a mark where you are. I'm going to put mine right next to Julie's because we're right next to each other. I think mine's hidden behind Julie's now. So we've got a few people in the States, quite a few in Victoria, some from Perth, nice to see Alaska and Arizona getting a mention there. Well, someone down on the Gulf. Quite a few Victorians. And uh, someone from Sydney as well, which is great. Oh, wow, someone coming from the Northern Territory. I might put one in for her. Is that Therese? Teresa. Fantastic. Welcome, Teresa. Okay, let's move along. So, bringing you Julie Lindsay. She is going to share with us Connect and Collaborate today. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Miss. And hello, everybody. Julie here. Hope you can hear me okay. It's great to be here uh, presenting once again for the Aussie Live Conference and uh, supporting uh, events on this side of the world. Give us a little bit of an edge with uh, time zones, etc. I'm going to talk to you today about some different ideas and actions to change the learning paradigm. And uh, there'll be some time, of course, for you to interact and ask questions. And I welcome ongoing comments in the chat. Uh, of course, I will try to refer to those as we go through. Don't be offended if I miss some as we go through as well, but we can always come back to them. All right, so this is me, and uh, I am currently at home with some questions in the chat. I live in Ocean Shores which is uh, when, we, when I was teaching I said that we used to talk about hardship posts. Well, Ocean, Ocean Shores is certainly not a hardship post. It's a lovely place to live and I feel particularly honoured that uh, I'm pleased and delighted that uh, we're able to live here at the moment. And of course, like, my journey has taken me to different, uh, many different countries around the world over 15 years from 98 until uh, 2012 when we came back to Australia. I'm a Melbourne girl and uh, we did go to Zambia, two different places in the Middle East, Kuwait and Qatar. We spent four years in Bangladesh and three years in China. Uh, but you know, in those places I was uh, a technology teacher, IT director, e-learning coordinator, curriculum coordinator, etc. And I was known in Melbourne actually as a music teacher with uh, lots of things happening in music technology, but that was a long time ago. The uh, book that I co-authored is Flattening Classrooms Engaging Minds and that is available through Amazon that uh, came out a couple of years ago now. I'm going to uh, speak today <coughs> about three different things uh, and I've split this uh, presentation into three different areas just to get a handle on it. I want to talk about global understanding. 
I want to talk about pedagogical shift and the social change that we need to see in teaching and learning to affect better, better teaching and learning and better, uh, better global understanding, basically. So they all sort of feed into each other. But let's see. So global understanding, of course, is a desire. We do want people to understand the world better. Uh, we do want people to be interacting with the world. And of course, going global is a mindset. It's not a plane ticket. You don't need to get on a plane to have an appreciation and understanding of the world. As we know, I think I know I'm talking to the converted in this room. You can connect and collaborate with the world. Of course, technology makes this uh, possible. Learning in context can mean learning virtually. So it's an important message that we need to keep saying and reiterating and sharing with our colleagues who perhaps aren't quite as global as some of us. If you're in this conference now, you're, you're a global educator. And you may just be reaching out and saying, well, this is my first step. But you are here, and you've made that first step. So it's about being curious enough, curious enough to want to know the real story <clears throat> and adventurous enough to go out and find it for yourself. Now, not everybody wants to sell their house and move to Zambia, like we did many years ago. <laughs> That's a pretty big step. But, but certainly, you can interact with uh, classrooms in Zambia. There's actually uh, some interesting things happening in Zambia at the moment that, uh, that I'd like to sort of make some more connections as well. So I'm going to tell you a few stories. In terms of global understanding, I'd like to start with just a few stories from the last, basically the last seven years. And these are stories from the flat and connected classroom. So some of the things that I've been doing, some of the things that people in this room have been doing with me as well. I want to start with the, in the story of the two C's. Now, these are two students. The one on the left uh, was mine, Kamel, when I was teaching in Bangladesh. And the one on the right <coughs> was from Camilla, Georgia. Uh, and these two students were in the very, very first flat classroom project in 2006. And uh, this is where we joined two classrooms together. And we thought, well, what will happen? Let's see what will happen. We'll use the wiki, we'll use Web 2.0. Skype had just become available. Let's see what we can do with these students. My students were largely Bangladeshi students. Kamel actually was a, a Belgian student. She was European. Uh, her father was an expat working in Dhaka at the time. Uh, and of course, Casey was very much a farm girl. Uh, I, I got to meet Casey's parents later, a couple of years later, uh, when I went down to, to Georgia, which was a great thrill as well. But these two girls developed a relationship that went beyond <coughs> what we thought the project was going to achieve. Not only did they do the required work in terms of collaborating on a topic together, uh, they also created uh, a video together to introduce their topic, and then, of course, a video together to share the research that they'd done and the, uh, the important points about their topic. So this, you know, this opened eyes. The understanding, the global understanding that these two girls got from each other through that, what was then only about a four-week collaboration, uh, was quite amazing. So that's the two C's. Let me tell you about Salam El Busari. <clears throat> Salam is the teacher second from the right as you're looking at this picture, and the other three boys are his students. Salam is from Oman. He's a teacher in Oman, and he reached out early on in uh, 2007, I think. How many different languages do I speak? <laughs> okay. I'm not very, actually, I'm not very good with languages. I can, I've got taxi knowledge of the different countries I've lived in, and that's about it. I can get in and out of a taxi and say good morning, good evening. That's about it. I'm sorry, that's embarrassing. But uh, thanks for that. <laughs> okay. All right, survival language, yeah. All right, so Salon reached out to, to what we were doing in flat classroom, and he desperately wanted to connect with the world. Uh, he wanted to connect his students. He wasn't able to embed this into his regular day um, of classes, but he ran an after-school club, and he had a small group of students. Uh, but he, you know, he ended up bringing four students to our conference in Qatar in 2009. He brought four students to the conference in Beijing in 2011. And he put students into our global collaborative projects, and they did this all as the extracurricular activity. And just amazing students, just wonderful to interact with and to learn. We've learned so much from these particular students and from Salah himself. It's just a, it has been a wonderful experience. And then, of course, we had Anne. And it's great to see Anne in the room. She may have popped out and been 
between uh, you know, doing different things. But Anne, of course, has been a great, uh, the, the story of Anne has been a wonderful story in terms of, of my connections with Anne. And Anne, of course, popped up really early uh, in the last few years in terms of flattening classrooms. And she brought girls, Australian girls, over to Qatar, over to the Middle East for the Flat Classroom Conference from uh, an isolated rural uh, area in Victoria, Hawthdale P12 College, of course, Anne is that. But, you know, she really wanted to bring that opportunity to the girls and to or to the students who were allowed to come and bring them to the Middle East. And that was a big thing, that was a really big step. We had other students in Australia who were not allowed to come to the Middle East for various reasons. There were uh, education authorities saying, no, they're not allowed to, it's too dangerous. Parents, of course, were, were fearful across the world of what we were doing in the Middle East. But the fact that Anne brought these girls and uh, gave them this experience just broadened their horizons tremendously. And once again, gave them that global understanding through that experience. Let me tell you about uh, the Vienna International School. In 2007, we implemented the very first DigiTeam project. I'm not sure if Teresa has heard this. Teresa Allen is actually our project ma manager for the DigiTeam project and just, just runs with it and flies with it. It's just it's wonderful. But it started way back in 2007 with uh, a teacher <coughs> called Barbara Stefanix who was the head of IT at uh, VIF uh, at that stage. And uh, <coughs> Barbara worked with us to implement this uh, action-based project, so research and then putting that, turning that research into action. And what her students did, this was one of the very first action projects from the, the, uh, the project, they created a digital citizenship day. So they totally immersed the whole 600 students in their middle school, secondary school level. And they had badges, you can see them making the badges there, the photos are a bit grainy, I know. But they had a, a students could sign this uh, agreement that they would be good digital citizens and it became a whole just wonderful uh, implementation or action. You can go to tinyurl.com, digiteam 2007 to see the work that is still up there on the 2007 wiki in terms of what Barbara did as part of that, uh, that project. So you know, that <clears throat> what we learned from them and what they learned from us, once again, fostered enormous global understanding. Okay, mouth on the water. All right, so then of course, <clears throat> I would like to talk to you about uh, when I was in uh, Qatar, and this is just a, a snap from my classroom, our three Qatari girls there. And it was interesting moving to Qatar uh, in terms, once again, in terms of the Middle East, and Qatar is perhaps the, more, the most liberal of, of the countries in the Middle East. Uh, I implemented the Flat Classroom Project with a class, mixed class. It wasn't a single-sex school, it was mixed gender, though I believe now it's gone back to single-sex, uh, single-gender classrooms, which is an interesting step for this particular school. Uh, but I implemented this project and you know, talked to the students, and we worked it out together. And I remember one of the very early conversations we had in this classroom was about choice. and. Previously, they had been told they needed to use the school cameras, they had to use the school firewire cables on the, what were then not particularly good uh, desktop PCs. And it all became a burden and a hurdle and a, a barrier to successful uh, creation of artifacts that they wanted to create. So <clears throat> after talking about it, we decided, well, you can bring your own cameras, bring your own mobile phones. And of course, many of these students uh, weren't short of a couple of dollars. So they started to bring their own technology in and it freed up the whole experience for them to be able to grab their mobile phone, take a quick video clip or an audio file or a picture and just to free that up made such a difference to be able to implement this particular project in this class. Uh, I remember this first parent-teacher uh, evening we had uh, for this school and for this class with this project, a mother came to see me and was one of my top students actually and she came with the, the whole abaya and head jab uh, Covered, not the whole face covered, but, but very covered, as, as, as they do, particularly as, as mixed parents teach you things. And she came striding down the hallway, and, and I thought, oh no, I'm going to be in trouble. I'm going to, she's going to tell me off for doing this global project. But she came and she was actually in tears. She said, I just want to come and tell you just what a difference has made to my daughter and to her global perspective, and we just think this project is wonderful. So that's a story that I love to share because it is. 
uh, a story of success in so many ways. Success that the parents can see how technology can support learning. Success for the students because they can get their hands on the learning. And really success for the teacher as well and for the school. So the school at that time didn't quite know what was going on <laughs> in many ways. I was just sort of doing it. But um, anyway, that's my guitar story. So let's keep moving. And this is another one. This is actually a group of Australian uh, students uh, who didn't make it to the Flat Classroom Conference in 2009 in Qatar, but they made it virtually. They presented and said, once again, sorry about the grainy picture, but the little inset picture, of course, is us, the audience. And they presented, um, this is uh, Anne Baird actually organised this, which Anne came over to Qatar, but these are her students. And they came in in their summer holiday, this was January, they came in to talk about digital citizenship to us virtually. And we went, wow, this is fantastic. And of course, we had, we had students from Ethiopia, India, Pakistan, Oman, etc. And here were these Australian girls presenting to us and interacting with us from Australia. And it was wonderful. Oops, uh-oh, there we go. All right, a couple more stories. And this is the story of Salvador. And that's just a little quote from Salvador's uh, blog when he started the project. And this is a student, he was a student from USA, from Texas, actually. And he was a, uh, his teacher tells us he was a very shy, uh, quiet student, considered a risk, a low achiever, not a native English speaker, uh, from a low income family. But he just embraced this project. He was in the uh, NetGen Ed project, which is very similar to the Flat Classroom project uh, at that stage. Uh, he loved the work. He, he actually used his experience in the project to apply for a, a, some sort of course that he did, where he got into this course because he was able to talk about his flattened learning experience and he really impressed the interviewers. So essentially, we, we could, can truthfully say this student's life was changed because, he's, because of his involvement in a global project, uh, our, you know, our particularly, but it could have been any global project that gave him this experience. Uh, and he moved into an area that he may not have got into if he hadn't had that flattened learning experience and that uh, enhanced global understanding. And finally, this is the uh, this is me with the class or the students from Hua Shi Yi Fu Yong. I hope I got that right. In Chinese speakers in the room, high school from Wuhan in China. And that's Stephen Walmart, who's a, a colleague of mine. Now Stephen was working in China. Uh, in 2011, this is the flat classroom conference 2011 in Beijing, and he was working in this school, the high school number one in Wuhan, and he had about 50 students who'd been especially selected for his pilot program. Now this high school had like 8,000 students in it. I mean, China doesn't do numbers, small numbers. China does big numbers. So we're talking about 8,000 students in a school, and somehow Stephen was working with about 50 of them, and, and the parents are given special permission for Stephen to have these students in this sort of pilot project. He was working with the Chinese government at the time. So he was implementing project-based learning and he was, you know, had very few resources, but he was doing some great things and bringing in some mobile technology, some iPads, etc. And these students were actually, you know, in Chinese terms, were actually quite privileged students. Their, their parents had a bit more money, as a number of parents do now in China. So they actually had, you know, had some money to buy some tools, etc. So Steve said, look, he wanted, to, he wanted to bring these students to the conference. I said, oh, that's fantastic. Bring them along. So he brought nearly 20 students to the conference. And of course, these students were number one students in their school. They were the elite. They were the privileged. And of course, when they came to the conference and they were mixing with students in all parts of the world and the USA students and the other Asian students, etc., it was an extremely humbling experience for them, an extremely valuable experience because it gave them a window to the world that they had never had in Wuhan before. And uh, they, they, they struggled a little bit with their language. It wasn't so much the language, it was the, oh my goodness, these other students actually understand more and know more than me. And they, you know, thinking that they were the number one was quite a shock. And you know, Steve said to me, he said, I think that first night he had quite a few in tears uh, with the shock, the realisation that there was a big world out there and that there were students at all different levels. So I love telling that story as well, about how their perspective changed once again. I'd love to follow up with some of these students. Wouldn't that be a wonderful research project? I don't know how I would do that, but it would be great. 
So, you know, whatever it takes, we do need to join our worlds together. Whether we do it in real time through running these conferences around the world, which, which I've been involved with, and people like Anne and Teresa have, have helped me with conferences and workshops. And uh, whether we do that or whether we do it virtually, we must join our worlds together. We have to focus on cultural understanding, global confidence, international mindedness, and, uh, and move always in that direction. Okay, so let me move to the second part of the presentation, which is looking at pedagogical shift. And just a quick explanation. So we're looking at how we can ch ch the change in teaching and learning beliefs <coughs> and practices, moving it from this sort of transmission paradigm where we transmit knowledge or we share knowledge and we just move it from one person to another to this constructionist paradigm. So this is really what I'm talking about when I talk about a pedagogical shift. So, thanks Gail, you're off? Okay. Bye for now. So what does this look like? So the pedagogical shift is, is moved to, to a constructionist, constructionist paradigm. We're really talking about community building. And this needs to be a prerequisite to learning. And uh, when I build uh, projects and when uh, colleagues and friends help me build projects, you know, the community has to be uppermost. You know, what, who are these learners? How are we holding hands? And how are we moving through this learning process together? It could be four weeks, it could be 12 weeks, it could be a year. Uh, but we must do it as a community and build this knowledge together. And of course, collaboration. Collaboration that leads to co-creation. And we had a conversation about this yesterday, of course, and being able to contribute. You know, collaboration starts with contribution and then it must lead to co-creation. And of course, this pedagogical independence and leadership within a school, uh, not being confined um, to certain modes that restrict this pedagogical shift. So just a little bit of background about constructionism. I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here, but we're, we're talking about Piaget, we're talking about learning by doing, the whole active learning process, uh, bringing creativity, tinkering, exploring, building, presentation uh, to the forefront, and of course the maker movement, uh, the work that uh, Gary Steger and Sylvia Martinez are doing at the moment amongst lots of other people, uh, of course, is part of this uh, constructionism approach. This is an interesting one. This is a, a jo Jonan, I think that's how you say it, Jonan Donaldson from the Oregon State University. I thought I'd share this with you because this is a, um, well, what we call hybrid pedagogy, but it's related to what I'm talking about. Uh, and it, he calls it authorship learning, where you take this sort of project-based learning, student ownership of learning, and collaborative learning, and you mix it up, blend it up with sort of cognitive and construct constructivism and constructionism, etc. And this whole idea of you know, learners as authors uh, and being able to learn and create things and interact with people. So my premise is that really we need to flatten the learning hierarchy uh, and this is essentially what it means by, what I mean by flat learning. Students and teachers and all learners must have the freedom to communicate, communicate across rather than up or down. So the, the traditional uh, mode of learning, of course, is the, the down. Teachers to, uh, teach down um, and students look up and they, they send their assignments up to the teacher. But if you start to flatten that, then of course you have these other learning modes that go across that, communicate across, which can bring in other types of learners. Peers, of course, experts, uh, all different types of learners into the learning process. And of course, oh goodness, that's a bright picture, isn't it? Technology must be the bridge, not the barrier to shifting this pedagogy. All right, so in so many respects, technology is still the barrier. Uh, things are blocked at school or uh, things aren't working. Um, you don't have the skills because you, uh, perhaps you haven't had time or the training to, to do that first step. Uh, but technology must be the bridge. You've got to make it the bridge. And of course, we're talking about uh, this integration of Web 2.0. So, and I'm sorry that's such a lot of words there. I've a few slides with a lot of words, but I didn't want to miss anything. But we are talking about this um, 
you know, different contribution modes, different tools, learner centered, but once again, very much a constructivist learning environment. And we're really, when I talk, I'm assuming Web 2.0, this, this really is what it has to be. It has to be the read right way. And Jan says the school firewall drives me bonkers. It drives me bonkers for so many years, and I'm, I, at the moment I'm pleased not to be working in the school firewall, I'll tell you. I was, just, I was just thinking the other day, Jan, actually, that when I worked in a school, with a school network, I had so many issues with my laptop and with my devices, and now I'm working at home, I don't have any of those issues. And I'm not criticising my wonderful IT department that I worked with, and I was usually in charge of the last 10 years of my, my international teaching. I was the leader of those departments. But, you know, we need to look really carefully now at what it means to have a, a, connect, a school network and go for that cloud computing and go beyond the lockdown approach at IT departments. Okay, so we're talking about this pedagogical shift, this use of Web 2.0 tools is merely, uh, sorry, is, is beyond merely integrating technology. So I know we have, you know, we have technology integration specialists, and, and that's a great label, it's a great, you know, uh, thing to be in a school, but I think that we're starting to move away from that term. We have, uh, I know, Ness, I think you're a pedagogical uh, expert, your title has the word pedagogy, and that's doesn't it, and, and teaching and learning uh, coordinators is becoming more popular. Uh, so, just this whole integration of technology, it's almost like we're over it. Let's get over it because we have this, this new category of tools. That's a great title. Thanks, Ness. Leader of pedagogy is great. So we've got this new category of tools and learning habits that support global collaborative objectives. And it really is beyond tech integration. And we're talking about, once again, connected learning and communities of practice. And we must always be connected. And this is a message to get across to our students and our, our teachers and our leaders in the school, etc. That we need to learn social, we need to use social learning systems. We learn best when we are social. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> uh, we do learn best uh, learning with others. And we, you know, we bounce ideas off, we get clarification, we get confirmation from others, etc. And so we need to look at how can we foster this sociability of online and blended learning with our students, with our colleagues, and implement connectivism and networked learning. I'd like to mention George Siemens. I actually had the pleasure of meeting George in uh, Qatar at the WISE conference last November. Such a lovely, lovely man. Just wonderful. And because he's written a lot about connectivism starting way back in, well, 2000. Or I think he's, he's one of his main ones that we still refer to as 10 years ago now. But, but he says, that, you know, the pipe is more important than the content in the pipe. So it's really the, now who's in the pipe, who's moving, who's moving around and connecting, it's really more important uh, in terms of learning from each other. So he developed or has, has co-developed this theory of, of connectivism, which is related, of course, to uh, con uh, constructivism. Uh, no, MS Word doesn't recognise connective, connectivism. Maybe uh, the being that in the last 10 years. But he's talking about you know, that learning and knowledge are contextual and new information is constantly being acquired. And really, it starts with the individual. Uh, there's a cycle of knowledge, and uh, we need our personal learning networks that, so we can update and remain current. So it's really worth having a look at some of George's work. And he'll pop up if you go connected with him, he pops right to the top of Google then. So there's this whole thing about, you know, when we talk about pedagogical shift and the content versus the process. And once again, my premise is that in a flat and connected learning environment, content is second to the process. And I know that we, we all have, when we're in the classroom, we all have content that we need to get curriculum whether it's something that we create or whether it's something that is that is said you have to teach this content. But, you know, I really think we're, we're at the point where that needs to erode a lot more than it has in the last five years. Content is not so important. It's really the process. Flat learning, connected learning, connectivism, constructionism, the process has to come first and then the content will find its way and really needs to come a lot from the students. What do the students really want to learn? Do we ask them? 
So, and content is no longer king. Thank you, Peggy. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly what I mean. Absolutely. Process. And the actions to connect and flatten the classroom. These were the things that I talked about this yesterday. I'll just put it all onto one slide. There you go. I'm not going to spend ages talking about this again. Uh, yes, Haiku Deck, isn't it wonderful? I love my telephone box. I found that one the other day. <laughs> So the process, of course, is connecting and communicating, developing good digital citizenship skills, uh, being able to contribute and collaborate, having choices for learning. You know, do you have to use the school equipment or can you bring your own mobile devices that you are much more familiar with and do a much better job for you, etc. Choices for creating as well and, of course, celebrating. And it's always technology-infused learning. Uh, tweets to teach. Gregory, thank you. Uh, absolutely. There has to be some content direction for the teacher and the teacher, of course, moving into that more collaborative facilitator uh, role uh, and the flattened hierarchy of learning in the classroom, whether it's virtual or real, will always have that role of directing and uh, encouraging and suggesting and mentoring and coaching. Absolutely. So as we build our personal learning networks, as we go through the process of learning, these are all the wonderful faces of people in the Flight Connections Network, some of them, we need to look at strategies that will support meaningful interactions that lead to collaborations and creations, etc. So strategies for you, strategies for your school, strategies for your students. And conversation, of course, uh, is is one of those big strategies. Coming to conference like this, of course, is a strategy. And of course, getting your head around blended learning modes. So not just synchronous, but asynchronous as well. Of course, synchronous is a, a virtual meeting room like we're in now. That's actually a screenshot from a tool called Fusebox, where we had a meeting last week. And the image to the right is a screenshot from um, a Ming that we're using at the moment to bring 500 students together from across different places in the world. And at the moment they're commenting on each other's handshake videos, they're posting a status, they're posting videos, etc. You can see a very small snapshot of what it looks like when 500 students come into a Ning. And this Ning, of course, is public. It's the Flat Connections Global Project.net. FlatConnectionsGlobalProject.net will take you right into this link. These are high school students, or they're uh, age roughly 14 or 15 up to 18, and this is all public. You can interact, you can join the link. Uh, educators are welcome to join and to see what's going on. Look, Miller is a great colleague of, of ours at Flat Connections. I just I was in contact with Miller this week. She's going to bring in some of her pre service teachers as expert advisors once again to this project. Um, sorry, Peggy, there's no dot there. Thanks. Let me try that again. No dot between the Flat Connections and the Global Project. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> okay, so. And I'm sorry, I don't have it at my fingertips to turn to the chat. I'll just keep talking here. <laughs> so global collaboration, I always say this as well, global collaboration by its very nature implies asynchronous collaboration. Of course, we do want to grab those synchronous engaging moments. Yes, grab those Skype interactions, grab those Google Hangouts, grab those real-time chats, that mean that you can go to and see those uh, students in the project. There's a real-time chat window there, and they're in there. Uh, and they're chatting away and helping each other. How do you do this? Someone else on the other side of the world is helping them do it, you know, teaching them. It's wonderful. Um, talking about that, I wanted to mention that story actually, Anne, that we were chatting about the other day. Anne has got students in that project I mentioned, Flat Connections Global Project, and her students were uh, chatting <coughs> with other students from the USA uh, in real time about uh, how they use guns. And Anne reached out to me, I was working here in London, and said, do you think they should be talking about guns? And so actually, you know, they were both country boys living in rural areas, Australia and USA, and they were having a harmless, I thought it was pretty harmless talk about, you know, what they shoot and what sort of guns they have. And so we, we were monitoring, as we do as educators, we were monitoring the conversation. But um, 
Yeah, and the fact that the USA boys were shooting different things, so it was once again global understanding, and it's no, there was no need for Anne and I to go in there saying, oh, no, you can't talk about guns, because in fact, guns were part of these students' lives, so it was actually good to see. But, you know, monitoring is important. When students are in these social educational places, you do need to monitor as teachers and just, just keep an eye out and remind them. And that's the other thing is Anne mentioned that her student, who was a particularly disengaged student, has become quite engaged and engrossed in this project through this connection. So once again, another story to tell. And we'll see where this takes us because we've got another 10 weeks or so to go for these students to work through the project. So, you know, this asynchronous collaboration builds effective communities and we must monitor these communities. Uh, and this is, these are essential pedagogical applications that teachers, teachers need to be confident with. And I know it's a big step if you haven't done a global project or you're not sure what to do or how to start. It is a big step that, uh, you know, that these are things that you need to work towards in terms of pedagogical issues. And just to finish this section, Uh, sorry, yeah, Jan, just, I'll just top in there. Jan, do teachers collaborate on project guidelines? Yes, absolutely, we do. Uh, we, we have a team of teachers who uh, meet just about every week. Over the 12-week project, teachers meet almost every week as a teacher group uh, in real time. It's recorded for those who can't make it, and uh, they work it out. There is an infrastructure and a general timeline and process, and the teachers work it out as they go along as well. It's a really exciting process. Uh, just briefly, other pedagogical shifts. Uh, we're talking about this sort of agency from individual learning uh, being shifted to community learning. And I know that we're still stuck in this uh, assessment cycle uh, where we tend to assess the individual rather than co the collaborative or contribution uh, that they make. Uh, and that's a whole other presentation. I'm not really going to get into that in this presentation. But it's there. It's the elephant in the room. Uh, this whole idea of peer pedagogy, you can look up Howard Reingold and what he has to say about peer agogy. It's really important and interesting work there. Uh, developing architecture of participation, you know, what does this look like? What, what are the different forms of participation? How can we design different architectures? Uh, looking at teacher professional collaboration patterns. I mean, what are the patterns within your school, beyond your school? What is the expectation on you as an educator to collaborate? Is it talked about in your school, in your network? It should be. Um, and of course, the contribution that leads to effective collaboration, which I've mentioned. The chat we had yesterday in the session, I mean yesterday morning, uh, we also added some extra C words. I just wanted to mention that to thank the people. I think some of you were in that session yesterday as well. Uh, in terms of uh, being, you know, being a champion, champion uh, teacher who champions learning to students. Student leaders who champion learning, learning for other students. Uh, being a regular, reliable and responsible contributor. And of course, building champions of change. Thank you, Michael. Oh, thank you. And of course, building community. Uh, very important. Peggy says, I've heard teachers say they often find it easier to collaborate with peers around the world than in their own school. And that is so true still of so many people. I know, and uh, <coughs> I'm coming to something very interesting about that as well. Thanks, <laughs> Peggy. And he's always one step ahead of me. It's great. Okay, mm -hmm. another mouthful of water. Let's keep going. So this, this is an image I picked up from Wes Fryer online. Thanks, Wes. We're here for the learning revolution. So talking about social change now. <coughs> All right, the change we need. We need to build communities. Before we can start talking about learning, we need to talk about community and what that looks like. How do students join a community? How do they feel that they're part of a learning community? And, you know, we're, and in a typical school, of course, we're talking about students with all different socioeconomic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds. I mean, particularly in Australia, we have many cultures here, as, as I know the USA has as well, uh, in certain areas, not every area. Uh, so how do we build that community? How do we give people a place in that community. Oh, once again, collaboration that leads to co-creation, uh, being able to you know, do this in the same, with people who are not in the same space and time, and of course, it's pedagogical independence. That's the change we need to see. And the challenge is, of course, 
uh, future belief in this condition to do with technology and pedagogical change. So, so we've got to look at what are these beliefs and dispositions and how can we uh, mould these so that we do have change. And then what is the catalyst for change in teachers' practice to a more constructive approach? So if we say, well, okay, uh, in, a, in 21st century learning, in a digital learning environment, we do want to have a connected, constructive learning environment. We want to build community. So how can, what, what can we use as a catalyst so that we can move teachers' practice towards this? <clears throat> So some of the research, what some of the research is telling us, now I, I must admit I don't have all of the sources on the slides, but I can certainly, when I upload these slides, I'll give you a link to some, some research material and some, uh, some of the work I've been looking at. So if you want to go a bit deeper with this, uh, you can. But the research is telling us that you know, when teachers adopt technology, uh, they do this often without changing their pedagogy. And they, in order to do low-level tasks, so in other words, they're, they're really just, you know, adopting the technology, not really moving across to adapting or transforming, which is the, the, the process of, uh, that we want to see. So that they can happily do that, and it doesn't really affect them so much. But, but if we say, well, okay, now come on, you've got to start adapting and moving beyond just implementing uh, technology to do a simple task. But if they start to feel pressured to change their pedagogy, they're more likely to resist adopting this technology altogether. So this is an interesting thing to think about. Now think about yourself. Think about if you're a technology coach or a, a pedagogy leader or whatever, and, and the work is so hard and often times in the school to, to start moving some teachers. And sometimes it doesn't matter what you say, they will continually resist. So it's really looking at um, how do you start bringing them in and just moving them slowly forward. And the research also tells us why technology is integrated differently. Now we talk about first order barriers and second order barriers. And your first order barriers are your environmental, so you know, have you got the hardware, have you got the software? Now if you've got this, which most, well, generalisation, that's probably the people I'm talking to in the room, you're probably in schools where, yes, you do have some hardware, you do have some software, you can, you can do something with the technology. And of course, teacher knowledge. Uh, generally, teachers do get some access to professional development. And of course, really, there's no excuse these days. This conference is completely free, as are so many of the conferences that emanate from Steve Harvard and, and a number of other people around the world, free webinars, etc. So, uh, you know, we, you can get the knowledge. <coughs> for example, about TPAC or SAMA or uh, flat connected learning, for example. So, so you know, the first sort of barrier. We can get over that. But it's this second order barrier, this, this whole teacher belief system that is really holding us back. So the barriers. You know, the external barriers in terms of hardware software, they can and have been eliminated in many cases. But these beliefs, this knowledge and skills, attitudes and beliefs, these are the gatekeepers. So these are the things you can think carefully about your situation. You probably, you probably agree that this is what is holding people back. So the research also tells us that you know, this, um, being able to use new tools, uh, becoming familiar with them, and embedding teacher learning into an existing pro program does start to shift attitudes. So it's just embedded professional development rather than this, and I know schools are still, uh, largely because of timetabling, because of logistics, uh, it's this, oh, let's grab one day at the start of the year or one day at the start of the second semester. Let's do a whole lot of professional development. Oh, and then the next day you're back in class with your head still spinning, wondering what went on and then wondering how you're ever going to implement this. And the research is really telling us that this is not the way to do it. It needs to be embedded. So you need to look and say, well, I'm going to take on this 12-week global project. This will be my professional development. Uh, this is my goal. Uh, you can document it in terms of what your school expects you to document, etc. And uh, this will start to shift attitudes. So what about global learning? Let's kind of think back to so this presentation is about, well, how do we go global? How do we foster global learning? So this knowledge amongst teachers is quite low about how to embed global learning. And 
for many teachers, of course, are not are not um, opposed to it. Anyone I normally talk to say, "Oh, that'd be great. I'd love to do, to do that in my classroom. I really want to embed global learning. I really want to connect with China. I really want to connect with Indonesia, whatever." So it's not as though they're resisting it necessarily, but the phenomena is at the moment that those who are doing it, those who are integrating global learning, really becomes a, a personal commitment rather than a formal curriculum uh, or a requirement from the school. And uh, so we need to think about this. And this has got implications for uh, policy makers, teacher preparation programs, um, uh, PD decisions that are being made in your school, etc. So also thinking about global learning, is a textbook going to provide adequate global learning information and experiences? And I think we probably all say no. And just in the Australian context, well, the Australian national curriculum, with its focus on inter intercultural understanding, which is very important and very exciting, Will this be the catalyst we need? I'm saying it will probably be one of the catalysts eventually. So we need to take this on board. <laughs> I can dream. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. So a closer look at professional development. We do need a paradigm change. We need to move from this training, which is often like, let's take one day and we train. And that's okay. If you want to learn Microsoft Word, Go and take one day and train on Microsoft Word, but it's not going to take your learning global. It's not going to uh, embed new beliefs and attitudes that will change you as an educator. So we need to have experiential learning. We need to have this embedded PD. Welcome, Lucy. I think you've just joined us. Great to see you. Uh, we need to have a PD that includes virtual blended online and other modes. Uh, go on to the days where you sit in a room in a school and say, I'm doing professional development and close the walls, close the doors. The walls must be flattened when you do professional development in your own school. And somehow you've got to work this out. Uh, one of the ways to do it, of course, would be for every school to have a global collaboration coordinator, uh, which is an external person uh, who actually starts to move with the school and blend the learning uh, in so many ways for students and for teachers which is a role that I'm doing actually at the moment with a school called Think Global School. So the professional development must also focus on increasing teachers' knowledge and skills, uh, which of course should lead to increased confidence, reduced fear, et cetera, et cetera. I apologize for reading these words out, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure I covered everything. All right, so strategies. We're looking at strategies to promote teacher belief change. So we can look at, you know, Observation, teachers being able to observe other teachers. And once again, in a virtual sense, you're not, you are not just confined to what is happening in your school or learning environment. Uh, we must look at teacher practice. We must look at re reflection practices, social cultural support. And all of this can be done through collaboration and network. Good comment, Peggy. Thanks for that. Yes, how do you validate your cultural understandings when you are forming them for connection with just a few people to keep from creating stereotypes? And that's, that's so true. We want to break through these stereotypes, break through the stereotype of what it means to be a teacher. And you know, I think Australia is typical of many, uh, many countries around the world, probably most countries, where teachers do not move a lot. Um, the opportunities that I've had in the last 20 years have been to, to be very mobile. Uh, which has been great for me, but when you're not particularly mobile for whatever reason, uh, you do need to reach out. Um, teachers are staying in school for many, many years, uh, and it's, you know, every so often you need to do a refresh and to bring you know, new ideas in and, and do that through, through uh, virtual means. Okay, so we've got this what we call outlier pedagogy, and this is part of the shift as well. And the, uh, uh, an educator called Soraya, uh, Soraya Artiega, uh, who's a great uh, colleague as well. And she just did her PhD at Walden University. Uh, and she looked at this whole outlier pentecost, who the outliers are and what they do uh, and how they bring collaborative and global learning into their classroom. And uh, she said social media based outlier teacher pedagogy changes the learning ecology and makes learning ubiquitous. So we need to take a closer look at what this outlier pedagogy is. And another word I use for it is teacherpreneur. So a teacherpreneur, and we talk about this in the book actually just very briefly, 
it's uh, you know bringing these um, profitable learning experiences for students through connected partnerships uh, and uh, just raising the bar in terms of going beyond, above and beyond. And yes, perhaps it takes a little extra time, perhaps not. It's really a mindset rather than a, oh no, it's something extra I have to do. So, you know, a, a process for a teacherpreneur uh, and a leader, the whole leadership piece, of course, is getting an idea, fostering excitement amongst other teachers, and a group of teachers coming together to do something significant. And once again, it doesn't have to be in a real face-to-face -face sense, it can be face-to-face -face and virtual. So a teacherpreneur is an innovator, all those things, uh, and this teacherpreneur outliner uh, does all of these things as well. So you know, when we're talking about taking classrooms global, we're really talking about uh, you know, fostering teacherpreneurs within our schools. Uh, good point, Piggy. Are profitable learning experiences those that involve money or more than that? No, we're talking about uh, profiting um, intellectually, profiting um, uh, socially, profit, you know, it's a different uh, use of the word profit, uh, not, not in an economic sense necessarily. But if we start to talk about social entrepreneurship, uh, that's a whole other um, uh, conversation as well. So, very briefly about educational leadership. Uh, the fact that, you know, we, this online and blended learning it's leveling the playing field. Uh, we, we must look at what leadership, you know, the, the changes in leadership that we must see to uh, support dig the, our digital learning world. And uh, leaders must support and encourage the teacherpreneur or outlier. So, so we've got this, you know, this, this structure within our schools. We've got our, our administrators who are often not in the classroom, etc. Now, of course, we've got our, our classroom champions who are often the ones who become the outliers and the teacher premiers. And some, somehow we need to, everyone needs to support each other to, to once again create the shift that we need to see. So how do they do that? Um, encourage customization of learning, support innovation, encourage an agile curriculum, and uh, support the development of new global relationships and solution designs. So, and once again, this, this needs to be talked about. These conversations are so rich and vital uh, in a school. And when you get the opportunity, whether it's a casual conversation in the staff room or whether it's a more formal staff meeting to look at and what this can do, what, how this can perhaps um, change learning in the school. Uh, yes, Agile could be flexible. Yes, yeah, good. So, Bringing this together, we're just about out of time. I'm just about finished. I've had some conversations with Justin Ralph recently, uh, he's a Harvard, Harvard researcher, you can find some stuff on, from him online, from him online, and he said in an email to me that teacher personality traits or competencies may shape their practice decisions, but he thinks that the cultural and workplace contexts shape people's behaviours in very powerful ways. So it's looking at that culture of learning within your school, within your network, and seeing how you can go beyond that and mould that to do all of the things that basically I've been talking about. So just as a recap, so I, I encourage you to um, continue to share your stories of, for global understanding. These stories will eventually encourage and inspire and motivate others. Continue to explore how technology is changing the pedagogical paradigm and how global learning is supported through this change and be an advocate for social change in teaching and learning. So we're talking about teachers' beliefs, behaviours and habits of learning. Take on a leadership role and be uh, an advocate for and a teacherpreneur. Cool, almost there. Okay, so and if you want to learn uh, a lot more about this, of course, please come and join us at the Flat Classroom Conference in Sydney uh, at the Shaw School. Uh, I'd love to see you there. We're bringing students and teachers as we've done in Qatar, in Beijing and Japan. Michael will be there. Uh, I'd love to see a lot more of you uh, try and, and, and get there. I know, you know it's an economic challenge and uh, whatever, but uh, we'll be talking a lot more about this at that particular event. Uh, there's some connections for you in terms of the, a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment, connecting people, learning about the world with the world. 
flatconnections.com. Come and join our teacher network, flatconnections.net. You are most welcome to come and join the conversations there. Any questions? I've left you like one minute for questions. Uh, Thank you so much, Julie. Like you know, give you a like we'll collaborate round of applause, everyone. Find your smiley face. Please it's fantastic, Julie. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. As and always, it's been a uh, pleasure to be here now. It sounds like we have a question. To be a keynote at this conference. Thank you so much. Um, so I would like to thank you very much for the time you have given us today uh, and yesterday. And I always get so much out of these fantastic sessions. So thank you once again, and thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, we do have Coach Carol looking at portfolios in one room, and then Eric Walters from New York City, who's sharing with us how you can incorporate social justice issues into a science classroom. He did a session this morning that was fantastic. So please join them there. Thank you again, Julie. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>